That's the first tornado I ever saw. And to me, it's still the best one. The Wizard of Oz tornado was terrifying. The roar of the storm. A wall of fire. Blew the train completely off the track. Man against nature. It would create its own rain cloud. Cumulus, Nimbus, Cirrus, and Stratus. Ask for them by name. For mankind, there's always been one constant about the weather. It is forever changing, and the ways it can impact our lives are almost infinite. It can provide the winning edge in war or influence the winning score for the home team. It has the power to create and destroy nations, inspire and confound scientists, and even help make a fashion statement or two. I'm Harry Connick, Jr., and these are the 100 biggest weather moments. Beyond revealing looks at record-setting storms, you'll also find moments that highlight the human spirit and help shape our view of the world around us. Before we start up our countdown, let's take a look back at the moments revealed last hour. to our next weather moment. For the 1996 blockbuster movie Twister, it took millions of dollars and countless computers to digitally recreate the devastating power of a tornado's rampage on film. Yet six decades earlier, when it was time to send a girl from Kansas and her pet dog on a one-way ticket to Oz, all the producers had on hand were a few thousand dollars, a windsock, and a little bit of that old Hollywood magic. The result? A first-of-its-kind effect that generations later still thrills and chills audiences. It's a twister! It's a twister! Hello, I mean, that, The Wizard of Oz was a scary film. That tornado was so realistic, so well done, so mesmerizing. When you get that tornado up front and in your face in a movie theater, and you're about eight or nine years old, that leaves an impact. The idea of it still terrifies me. I've never been in a tornado. It was one of the first times that people who did not live in those areas got a chance to see storms like that. The Wizard of Oz portrayed a tornado as something harrowing, but also something pretty visually spectacular. That's the first tornado I ever saw, and to me, it's still the best one. As outrageous as it is, it's not far from reality. The tornado is kind of this long, skinny thing, and it's whipping back and forth. To put that on screen back in the late 30s, I mean, you got to be kidding me. That was awesome. Debris flying and the, and the wind howling and the violence and all that that's going on, how violent they are, is pretty pretty dead on. The tornado has this uh, malevolent appeal to it. It's not just a tornado. It's also Dorothy's undoing. She's in the house, and she's kind of knocked about, and she's finally knocked out by something on her bed. And the house picks up and takes off. Do you remember that? That was scary. This is not a test. Is this a test? What's the matter with the sirens? Are they stuck? What do we have to do to get these damn sirens turned on? If we didn't have tornado warnings now, imagine 
what would happen? The United States has the most violent weather of any nation on Earth. We have, on the average, a thousand tornadoes a year. From the time the United States Weather Bureau was established in 1870, the word tornado was banned from all official communications out of concern that panic would erupt in the general population. What is worse, scare everyone and get them on edge or, you know, kind of, I guess, just hope for the best? There wasn't any kind of radar, there was no satellite, so there wasn't any way that you could really detect the tornadoes coming. You have no idea where this thing's going to come down, how bad it's going to be. The first successful tornado forecast was done by two Air Force officers, Bob Miller and Ernie Faubush. A tornado had previously hit Tinker Air Force Base with no warning. And it was made abundantly clear to these young weather officers at the time that the commanding general didn't want any more surprises. In the middle of the afternoon, they indicated to the base commander that the conditions were right for tornadoes to occur that afternoon. Three hours later, a tornado struck Tinker Air Force Base. I think Fawbush and Miller had partly a bit of luck and partly uh, skill. And when the two came together, they made a gutsy call. And it turned out to, I think, be the beginning of modern forecasting of severe weather. The severe thunderstorm warning has been changed to a tornado warning. If you ask a non-sports fan to tell you the moment of man's greatest engineering achievement, he or she might tell you Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. Now ask a sports fan with a fondness for body paint, and he'll tell you it's the day the Houston Astrodome opened its doors. The time, technology, and money dedicated to developing and building dome stadiums over the last 40 years is staggering. And while purists may miss the wind, rain, and cold, it made the games a lot more comfortable for those wild-eyed, shirtless fans in the stands. They built one in Houston, the first one, because the weather was so oppressively hot and humid and mosquitoes were threatening to eat fans alive. And so you got the Astrodome, the eighth wonder of the world. I remember the first model of the Astrodome and said to myself that even by Houston standards, this may be a dream too far. They were going to build in the top of the dome of glass or plexiglass thing where the sunlight could get through. And, get this, it would create its own rain cloud. We would have a grass field in a completely enclosed air-conditioned dome. Crazy? Yes. Uh, because it didn't work. They tried to put real grass in. The grass wouldn't grow. That led, for better or worse, to the development of AstroTurf. Despite its initial setbacks, Houston's AstroDome, which opened in 1965, was an air-conditioned miracle that fans loved. Its success spawned a flurry of dome stadiums featuring artificial grass. In 2006, Phoenix joined the club, striking a balance between natural environment and weather control. Cardinal Stadium is actually a stadium that's really broken the mold in many different ways. This is the first dome stadium with a natural grass field, which is the preferred playing surface of players, that fully retracts. And it slides into the stadium, almost like a cake pan does into an oven. Dome stadiums have their place in sports, especially the new retractable domes. I don't want to see wind conditions or field conditions decide the outcome of the ball game. That's why I think dome stadiums are great. I want to see the best team win. She brought her love of nature to the world by way of, of her beautiful writing. Rachel Carson, a shy, unassuming biologist from western Pennsylvania, is one of America's most admired nature writers. Her poetic books about the ocean are considered scientific classics. But it was 1962's Silent Spring, her groundbreaking, controversial, yet moving account of the potential dangers of pesticides like DDT, that altered the course of history. I don't really want to eat poisons, nor do I want to feed poisons to my children. DDT was designed to kill insects that were attacking a crop. The problem is that it killed all the insects, even good insects. The birds would be the first to die after the insects. We were really moving towards having a silent spring. The insight that Rachel Carson had that was so profound was that people are connected to nature, that there's a web of life. Rachel Carson's concept that the use of DDT could impact an entire ecosystem was alarming to people. This ability to see the linkage between soil, water, and air became the foundation of the modern environmental movement. The environment became a focus of anxiety that something was out of control, and in fact it was. President Kennedy asked his science advisors to look into this book. It became politically impossible to not do anything about it. While her conclusions are still debated, Time magazine named Rachel Carson one of the 20 most influential thinkers of the 20th century. She was living proof that one person can make a huge 
huge difference. Coming up next on the 100 Biggest Weather Moments Countdown. He did it under the cover of a freak fall. The metal of the whistle was sticking to their lips and they actually ripped skin. Welcome back. Ever wondered why the NFL likes to play their Super Bowls in warm weather cities like Miami and San Diego? Well, you won't after watching our next weather moment. I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't a few Cowboy and Packer players that still need thawing out. I think this really is the most iconic game in NFL history. December 31st, 1967, they called it the frozen tundra at Lambeau Field. We had a temperature of about minus 15, wind of 15 miles an hour. That's brutal. Vince Lombardi said you could try to hammer a nail into the ground and you couldn't. It was so cold that people were sitting in their cars waiting for the kickoff, that they didn't come into the game until the kickoff. It was really as miserable as I've ever been in my life. It's you know, here I'm 19 years old, I can't admit it's miserable. How do you play football in that? Bottom line is they did. There were a lot of flasks in that stadium going around. Early in the game, the officials found that when they blew their whistles, that the, uh, the metal of the whistle was sticking to their lips and they actually ripped skin to, to get it out of their mouths. The Packers are down 17-14 in this dire situation. How are they gonna win the game? 16 seconds to go. Packers are on the two-foot line, third down. What do you do? Do you kick a field goal, go into overtime? You look around, all the fans, they're going to freeze. Bart Starr, he told Lombardi, hey, I think I could sneak in for the touchdown. Lombardi said, good, do it, and let's get the hell out of here. Bart Starr slid into the end zone for a 21-17 Packer win, and 50,000 frigid fans heaved a sigh of relief. The best part of the game is talking about it now that it's over. <laughs> By understanding the sun's relationship to the earth, we take a great step forward in understanding our weather. In the Middle Ages, conventional wisdom from both the church and science insisted that the earth was the center of the universe. But on a clear night in 1610, Galileo Galilei observed through his telescope that the moons of Jupiter appeared to be traveling around their larger host planet. To Galileo's peers, this was shocking evidence of the blasphemous notion that the earth revolves around the sun. Science before Galileo uh, was really quite different than what we would call science today. It was m much more a branch of natural theology. The sun's relationship to the earth, of course, is what has created our environment and life on this planet. If the sun suddenly went dark, that would be the end instantly. The creation of weather, its time, the calendar, Everything is about the sun for us. Because the Earth is tilted and on its axis, it has seasons. It's orbiting the sun, and that's causing the sunlight to strike. It strikes more at the equator than at the poles, which is why it's warmer at the equator. The Earth is constantly trying to balance the cold at the poles and the warm at the equator. The Earth has to transfer that heat northward. It transfers that heat by ocean currents and by storms. That whole relationship being the distance from the sun and, and the exact way we're tilted and it being cold at the North Pole and South Pole and warm at the equator and then the earth is trying to balance it and we get weather. Next time you're celebrating the 4th of July you might want to think about picking up a few foghorns to go with your flags and fireworks because without the aid of a timely thick morning mist this country's day of independence might never have dawned. Military history is replete with examples of when the weather has changed the course of history. For much of the American Revolution, the success of the Continental Army hinged on George Washington's ability to avoid capture. On August 27, 1776, 22,000 British redcoats invaded Long Island with a simple plan, get Washington and end the war. Throughout history, people have been trying to escape from Long Island, uh, but in this case, it was a life or death situation. George Washington defending Brooklyn Heights after the British attacked across Long Island. He was pinned against the East River by superior British forces. This was the first battle after independence was declared. Uh, it was the longest battle of the entire conflict. George Washington's army looked like it might be routed and the whole war for independence might have ended, but then a heavy fog descended. He redeployed most of the Continental Army. He got it out 
of Long Island and back across to Manhattan. And he did it under the cover of a freak fog that set in. So it was fog, something that we associate with the British, with London, of course, that gave George Washington the cover to escape from Brooklyn into Manhattan. I don't know why he just didn't take the F train. In the depths of the Great Depression, a few hundred out-of-work World War I veterans were sent to the Florida Keys to help with the construction of Highway 1. In late August, word arrived that a storm was heading for the Keys. The military requested a train to evacuate the men and their families who were living in flimsy tents and shacks. When the train finally arrived on September 2, 1935, it was a train bound for nowhere. About the time everybody started to clamor on the train, well, the hurricane was on shore. The surge hit, a tremendous surge, and winds were just absolutely out of control. It blew the train completely off the track. A lot of the people uh, died uh, hanging in trees, and their clothes were completely torn off of them by the blowing sand and wind. The only thing left on most of those survivors were their shoes and their belts. People thought they had died and gone to hell because the sky started lighting up with all these lights and sparks. And apparently it was from the sand that was blowing so fast that the friction and the static electricity was actually causing sparks in the sky. A lot of sheet metal from roofs were flying. And unfortunately, that was flying like razor blades through the sky and it decapitated quite a few people. They found people that were headless. Finally, after hours of unrelenting terror, the winds calmed. Unfortunately, it was only the passing eye of the storm. And it turns out the second wind, the wind on the backside, was stronger than the first one, according to the people that survived it. And that's where a lot of people died from the wind. It was just devastating. Coming up next, the creation of a life-saving label for tornadoes. And later, the brutal Russian winter dooms not one, but two tyrants when the 100 biggest weather moments continues. The most violent and unpredictable weather on the planet is the tornado. If you've ever heard the warning siren, or worse, been too close to that deafening roar, your heart begins to beat faster than you ever thought possible. Scientists have done their best to figure out these wind phenomena, but there's still much they don't understand. In 1971, however, meteorology took a big step forward when a professor at the University of Chicago put some method into this weather madness. Ted Fujita is probably the most important scientist in the history of the study of tornadoes. Ted Fujita was my mentor. Probably his greatest contribution was that he could make things so visual. He had tremendous drawings, conceptual drawings, that not only could be understood by the meteorologists, but also the public. He has been quoted as bringing order out of chaos. He developed the Fujita scale, the, the scale that's used to estimate tornado intensity. His scale goes from zero to five, with zero being the weakest. F0 is, is pretty much the smallest minimal tornado. F1 and F2, now you're starting to get into some substantial structural damage. Well, I was in an F2 and, and got to see it firsthand. An F2 rolls vehicles. It can roll vehicles over its shears, uh, telephone poles off. It's plenty powerful. It, it's a killer. F3, there's nothing standing but an interior bathroom or closet. The roof's off, the, most of the walls are done. F4, we're talking about the entire well-constructed house being leveled. And Dr. Fujita liked to say that F5 in some ways is better. At least the tornado has swept the foundation clean. And you can just start all over. In February 2007, the Fujita scale was updated to become the enhanced Fujita scale, or EF scale. And what we've realized now is that it doesn't take as much wind to destroy these structures. Alas, the enhanced Fujita scale, a rating that used to be F4 in some cases, would now be an EF3, which is a wind that's not as strong, but yet cause the same kind of damage. His scale is as good as anything we have, and it's likely to be all we have for a long time yet to come. The jet stream was discovered by a lot of different people around the world during World War II, but it was kept as a classified secret by the Germans, by the Japanese, eventually by the United States. It was during that time period that aircraft began to fly at the altitudes where the jet occurred. The jet stream is a narrow but powerful wind current that flows an average of six to eight miles above the Earth's surface. Bombers and fighter pilots who ventured high enough to encounter the jet found themselves blown off course or running out of fuel short of their targets. The first country to unlock the secrets of this high-speed river of air would use it to turn weather into a weapon. 
the Japanese apparently discovered the jet stream and uh, realized that um, they could launch balloons outfitted with uh, bombs and thermite grenades. Those balloons could ride the jet stream to the United States, and hundreds made it. They did result in the only civilian casualties suffered on American soil. These are all things that happened. We learned as we uh, progressed, we pushed the envelope. The jet stream remained a strategic consideration for all sides of World War II right up to the very end of the conflict. Today, both aviators and meteorologists continue to tailor their efforts according to the behavior of this atmospheric force. We began to understand as more and more aircraft observed this phenomena that this was something that was regularly occurring, that this was a structure in the atmosphere that we had to deal with. Up next on the 100 biggest weather moments. The temperature continued to rise. Cumulus, Nimbus, Cirrus, and Stratus. Ask for them by name. Welcome back. We all know about the great Chicago fire of 1871, Mrs. O'Leary's cow and all that. But on the very same day Chicago burned, another disaster occurred a few miles to the north in the vicinity of a small Wisconsin logging town. In many ways, it far surpassed the devastation in Chicago. About 300 died in the Windy City, while estimates range as high as 2,500 to the north. Today, only historians and Wisconsin school children remember this tragedy. And now, you will too. 250 miles north of Chicago, Peshtigo, Wisconsin was booming in 1871. The logging town of 1,600 residents was rapidly clearing the wilderness with slash and burn methods, leaving small fires constantly smoldering. On October 8, 1871, a massive cold front with gale force winds transformed America's great north woods into a holocaust. That wind going 100 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, that is just whipped up to a frenzy. And suddenly you have fire all over the place. You don't have one fire. You have half a dozen fires. You have 20 fires. It's not just on the ground. It's in the sky. It's in the tops of the trees. You get, in effect, blizzards of embers. Like snow falling, only it was fire. Terrified, the townspeople tried to escape as a tornado of flame a mile wide roared at them. There are reports of people slashing their own throats, not being able to move, and just killing themselves. They would try to get to water, but of course animals are also uh, rushing into that as well, so you have complete pandemonium. Women were particularly vulnerable because they had so many layers of clothing on, so when that clothing caught on fire, it would look like they were spontaneously combusting. They were absolutely certain the end of the world had Come. The consuming fire, in a, almost in a biblical sense, that it has commanded, taken over the entire landscape, including the air. A firestorm's temperatures reach about 2,000 degrees, which is the temperature of a crematorium. That's legitimately terrifying. By dawn, the firestorm had consumed a million acres of land before dying on the shores of Green Bay. All it needed was uh, the archangel and uh, trumpet blast, and it could have been the day of judgment. If we didn't have wind tunnels, we'd be still pedaling bikes around. We wouldn't be flying. In 1871, the study of aerodynamics took flight when Englishman Frank Wenham invented the world's first wind tunnel. Just as these large, gusty tubes provide aviators a safe way to test their aircraft without leaving the ground, the wind tunnel also gives meteorologists a heightened understanding of weather's most important vehicle. What a wind tunnel really does for us is lets us see the wind. The wind is responsible for making the weather, for changing the temperature, for changing the amount of moisture. Wind is everything in, in, in weather. There's a fascination with, I wonder what it's like inside there, you know, if I can be in control and turn the wind up and see what it's like. And then Dr. Steve Lyons, of course, does it. I wanted to see what very strong hurricane winds really felt like for myself. And two, I wanted to sort of show people what hurricane winds look like on television. It was like 15 or 20 people pushing on your midsection. The goggles had pushed so hard on my face that my I could remember trying to look out and my eyelashes were smashed against the goggles. You can do computer simulations, but it turns out that there's nothing that can beat actually looking and seeing what's happening with a, a real structure and real wind. When you warm up or you cool down the tropical 
Pacific, that is such a massive body of water that it affects the entire planet. From Christmas rains in the United States to summer droughts in Australia, a periodic surge of warm water in the Pacific Ocean creates a drastic shift in global weather patterns. Some scientists call this shift the most powerful climate force on Earth. The world calls it El Nino. The most studied and one of the most impressive El Nino events that we saw was the one that took place in the early 80s. That was an event that took a lot of people by surprise and it led to kind of the climate revolution of studying El Nino events and trying to figure out what they were and what caused them. Though the floods, drought and erosion from the 1982-83 El Nino caused nearly 13 billion dollars in damage to property and livelihood around the world, it provided scientists with valuable insight to the complexity of our planet's relationship to the atmosphere. It's your home heating bill. It's the likelihood of a flooding event. It's increased hydroelectric power. It's the potential for drought in the Southwest. With so many varied and contradictory impacts on the global climate, El Nino has become the prime suspect for a vast array of weather events around the world. I have a t-shirt, actually. It says, uh, don't blame me, blame El Nino. If anything was going wrong in 1997, for example, they tended to say it was due to El Nino. We still have a lot to learn about El Nino and other things that come into play with it. El Nino translates into so many different impacts, and the fact that they're worldwide just goes to show you that, you know, when the butterfly flaps its wings in one place, you can feel it everywhere. It's considered one of the greatest blunders in history, and like many mistakes before it and since, it was brought on by a man's belief he was Mother Nature's master. The Nazi army's winter march across Russia in 1941 was not the first of its kind to be attempted, but it just might be the last. Sometimes history repeating itself is a good thing. In December 41, Hitler's forces learn what Napoleon's forces learned the hard way, which is that you can't beat the Russian winter. During his retreat across Russia in 1812, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte lost nearly all of his 400,000-man army when he underestimated the effects of extreme cold weather. 129 years later, Adolf Hitler was determined to do what Napoleon could not, capture Moscow before winter. When Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, in the fall of 1941 in Operation Barbarossa, his troops were, they were assembled in, in late August, and they were in summer field uniforms. He thought it would be, in modern parlance, a slam dunk. His famous phrase was, we will give the door one good kick and the whole rotten edifice of Russia will come crashing down. It turned out to be more difficult than Hitler thought it was going to be. The Russian winter descended on him. They didn't have the clothing that was appropriate for winter time the whole thing just bogged down and stopped because of the freezing cold hitler's officers urged him to allow a retreat but haunted by the demise of napoleon the german ruler refused he told his troops stand and fight and his troops stayed for over four years standing and fighting during four horrible russian winters five million german soldiers died uh, in world war ii of those, four-fifths of those soldiers died in the Soviet Union. Never underestimate Mother Nature. Well, Hitler underestimated nature in terms of the ferocity of the Russian winters. When amateur English meteorologist Luke Howard developed a cloud classification system in 1802, the mysterious world of clouds began to yield to science. Known as the godfather of the clouds, Howard identified four basic varieties. Cumulus, stratus, Cirrus. Every morning I get out, look up, look at the clouds, and literally the clouds you see in the morning really define the day. Sometimes they tell us, well, today we should have the barbecue. These are stratus clouds. It's not going to be too bad. Cumulus, stratus, cirrus. And uh, you see these beautiful towering cumulus clouds, and you just want to jump in them. Everyone, you know, looks at clouds and sees animals or spaceships or whatever, so it's just endlessly fascinating to me. There's uh, the cirrus cloud, the cumulus cloud, the stratus cloud, and the... The, the, the really dark, rainy cloud. I love sitting out in my backyard just looking at the clouds at times, especially when there's some kind of a storm moving in. A nimbus cloud is a raining cloud, so if you, if you, if you see one and it's not raining where you are, then if it's coming towards you, it's going to rain pretty soon. I didn't know I was doing Jeopardy!
When I see Sirius, I think of I think of fair weather and I think of ice and clouds. And generally, you get fair weather out of those. Cumulus, Nimbus, Sirius, and Stratus. Ask for them by name. The torrential rains that descended upon Johnstown in South Fork, Pennsylvania on May 30th and 31st were the worst to hit the area in modern times. Six to ten inches fell in a 24-hour period. The rains began and the rains never stopped. The Connemaw River, the Stony Creek were both coming out of bank. There was a lot of water moving through downtown Johnstown. What they didn't realize is what was going on up at the lake. South Fork Lake was on the side of a mountain 14 miles above Johnstown in a resort area for luxurious summer cottages. The lake above Johnstown was managed by the South Fork Fishing Club. This was a group of Pittsburgh industrialists, most prominent name Nowadays would be Andrew Carnegie. The wealthy club members had unwisely modified the dam around the lake by screening a spillway to improve fishing and by lowering the walls to build a road. For years, Johnstown residents had known the dam was weak and poorly maintained, but they tried to ignore the looming threat. However, the unrelenting rain strained the dam as never before. As the water comes over the top, the downstream part starts eroding away. So the dam becomes thinner and thinner, and eventually the whole thing just failed. At 4.07 p.m. on May 31st, 1889, a wall of water over 40 feet high roared down the mountain, destroying everything in its path. 20 million gallons of water moving at 40 miles an hour obliterated four square miles of downtown Johnstown, swept away 1,600 homes, and carried 85-ton locomotives for almost a mile. Bodies were later found as far away as Cincinnati, Ohio. 2,200 people dead, 10% of the city's population. You can't imagine the horror of that day. 99 whole families died. People actually survived the flood, but were trapped in the debris that then got burned alive when the debris caught fire. Negligence lawsuits were filed against the South Fork Club, but the courts ruled against the victims, declaring the disaster simply an act of God. It's poor people against rich people, and usually the poor people don't win. Coming your way on the 100 biggest weather moments. It was breathtaking. It was a rush. It's like nothing you've seen on Earth. Better buckle down and get ready because you still got to go through it the other side. Welcome back. In 2005, Katrina showed firsthand the damage a hurricane can do to the coastline of a developed nation. But when one of nature's most violent events bears down on less developed countries, the destruction can be equally horrific, and the human toll, unimaginable. Hurricane Mitch was the deadliest Atlantic hurricane in over 200 years. When it made landfall, Mitch had weakened to a Category 1, but the immense amount of moisture it had gathered made this slow-moving disaster perhaps even deadlier. The real impact was the fact that it just spun over Honduras for about three days and produced upwards of five feet of rain. Imagine five feet of rain in just a few days. With substandard buildings and hillsides stripped bare of vegetation, much of Central America was in harm's way. But Honduras and Nicaragua were at the center of the deluge. If it's slow moving and it has a lot of moisture with it and it sits in one place, that's a recipe for flooding disaster. You've got a stationary hurricane, you've got mountains, you've got big trouble. People are cutting down the trees and they're not replanting. So you've got a bunch of bare hillsides, you've got maybe some substandard housing. You get tremendous amounts of rain pouring on this area at one time. Well, there's nothing to hold all that hillside back. It's gonna go, it's just gonna become mud and it's gonna slide away. The mountains just were rampants of uh, flash flooding. There were mudslides everywhere. All the bridges washed out and we ended up with 10 to 15,000 people dead. It's really hope that we can learn from such a, a, a nightmare and avoid having people living in, in vulnerable areas. Um, but it's, it's unfortunately easier said than done. Those countries are still struggling to this day from that hurricane. In July 1943, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Duckworth, an instructor at a flight school in Bryan, Texas, was playing poker with a few British pilots. Talk soon turned to an approaching hurricane and Duckworth's small AT-6 airplane. A bunch of macho pilots sitting around and one says to another, you know, you can't fly your plane into this hurricane. Duckworth was told his plane was too small and, and not as good as the other ones. So he says, yeah, you better believe I can. Ended up in the eye of a hurricane of all things. He flies his plane to a hurricane just to show somebody up, and now we do it for real. Hurricane hunting was born. 
For over 60 years now, hurricane hunters have been saving lives by providing forecasters with indispensable information from the heart of the storm. But these flights are not without risk. We're flying into hurricanes, so there's an inherent danger there. Is it always easy? No. I mean, there's times the plane is totally tossed around, and maybe, maybe we are kind of crazy. I've been in three. Even a so-called moderate hurricane will scare the daylight out of you. I've had a few times where I've com completely out of my seat. Up and down for five or six hours just to see what it was like inside the hurricane and to feel the force. It was it was breathtaking. It's just like nothing you've seen on Earth. You, you break into an eye wall like that and it's just, you know, you think you can hear the angels. This great calm sense. And the birds, as you know, are all in the middle of the eye. Clouds kind of in a spiral around you. Wonderfully beautiful. I don't know how many times I've said this is like the coolest thing I've ever seen. If you got a camera, you take a few snapshots, but you better buckle down and get ready because you still got to go through it the other side. We all remember whether or not we got rained on last week or if there was snow last Christmas. But if you want to know what the weather was up to 500 years ago, you might want to ask a tree to find out. This is a rain gauge for New Mexico, right here. This is a rain gauge. It goes back to the year 200 BC. In the 1920s, Andrew Ellicott Douglas, an astronomer, single-handedly invented the science of tree ring dating, or dendrochronology. By studying the pattern of ancient tree rings, Douglas created a tree calendar, which accurately reflected precipitation and temperature for the southwest U.S. going back 13 centuries. Trees are literally nature's recording stations. We had to figure out ways to find historical thermometers that could tell us what our planet had been through in the past. And the fact that we could do that with a fair amount of precision is amazing. Building upon Douglas's primitive work, scientists realized that Earth's climatological record had been imprinted not only upon tree rings, but also within sediments in lakes and oceans, layers of glacial ice, coral reefs, and much more. From these elements, known as proxy records, scientists began to unlock Earth's distant past. An ice core is like a history book that you can read layer by layer. They drill these cores down into the ice, and there are bubbles of air that are trapped in these cores, little pieces of the atmosphere as it existed, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. They're the clues that the climate detectives have to uh, unraveling the past. It is meaningful data. We can reproduce temperatures within a fraction of a degree over millions of years. To understand the environment today and where it's going in the future, you need the past. How about the extended forecast? This afternoon, 38 degrees. Imagine trying to plan your week without the five-day forecast. But such long-range predictions were considered too unreliable until in 1939, when legendary meteorologist Carl Gustav Rossby demonstrated what was happening high in the sky. Rossby really was considered the greatest meteorologist of the 20th century. If you were going to ask me for a five-day forecast, it's really all about upper-level winds, and you look at the way, you know, weather is moving ac across the country. It was discovered that not all weather was generated locally. It just didn't suddenly materialize at your location, but instead was a series of U-shaped disturbances. And those waves, often called Rosby waves, move around the hemisphere at mid and high levels of the atmosphere. If you see something over in, in Washington state and more of the jet stream is, is going like this, you, you can tell that the southeast is going to get that depending on upper level winds in two to three days. If it's west, it comes east. Rosby's understanding of the upper atmosphere revolutionized the world of weather forecasting. The colorful and energetic scientist was celebrated around the globe. Before his death in 1957, his academic and scientific prestige peaked when he became the first and only meteorologist to grace the cover of Time magazine. At his parties, he would be writing equations all over the napkins. He would get new ideas several a day. He died in the middle of giving a seminar, and that's, I think, the, probably the way he wanted it. In every way, the most amazing person I've known. Coming up next, the stuff you spray in your hair gives scientists a scare when the 100 Biggest Weather Moments continues. Back in the day, the beehive was the hairstyle of choice for many female baby boomers. The ladies sure look good, but as scientists discovered in the 1970s, those dandy do's came at a price because the spray being used to hold that big hair up was giving the earth a little bit of a bald spot. 
The ozone layer is a very thin part of the stratosphere, but it performs a vital function, blocking cancer-causing UV rays from reaching our Earth. In 1985, a group of British scientists discovered a gaping hole in the ozone layer over the South Pole. Their findings were doubted until a Nimbus 7 satellite image graphically confirmed the ominous news. It was actually visual. There was, if you, the way they did these satellite maps, it looked like a big purple bruise in the atmosphere. So it really sunk into our collective consciousness. Someone like me who's had a large piece of her face taken off because of skin cancer, it's a really important issue. What the ozone hole discovery showed was that we make an enormous difference in this planet. Science knew mankind had a hand in this problem because two California scientists, Frank Sherwood Rowland and Mario Molina, had predicted the ozone loss in 1974 and already identified one of its primary causes, chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, used in aerosol sprays and air conditioning. By 1987, an international agreement began phasing them out. The public responded in a very positive way. They stopped using aerosol spray cans. The ozone hole is going to take time to repair. I mean, right now, the the estimate is that by 2060, by 2070, we'll start to see the ozone hole repairing itself. We had someone discover something that could affect the entire world and said, we've got to do something about it, and the world acted. It was one of the most significant moments in scientific history. The first TV weather forecast was a farm report from WRGB-TV Albany in 1928. It was little more than radio with pictures. By the 1950s, not much had changed. In the early days of TV, um, the reporters simply read the weather cast. Basically, rip and read. Here's the weather forecast for today from the U.S. Weather Bureau. As television began to transform America, it also transformed the weather report. TV stations began hiring weather forecasters who employed more visual and entertaining presentations. I once did the weather in a, in a clown outfit with no explanation of why I did it. You know, we were TV personalities looking for a way to get into TV, and weather was a way for a lot of us. And as we got into the 80s and the computer age, then things began changing. How do you stand in front of a blue wall or a green wall and point to the right place? I'd be pointing at Kentucky and saying Florida. What they didn't see are the 150,000 times you're like, there's Kentucky, there's Tennessee, there's Ohio. Today's weather with its stunning computer graphics presented by trusted meteorologists is not only entertaining television, but vital information for people's lives and well-being. And each year we know more and more and more about the weather and it just becomes more fascinating. Our time is up for this hour, but when our 100 biggest weather moments continues, a little wind blows one athlete a long way, a wayward snowball ignites a war, and a cold snap breaks the heart of a nation. I'm Harry Connick Jr. See you next time. I actually played the tornado in a ballet version of The Wizard of Oz. I was several things, but amongst them, I was uh, one of the members of the tornado. And we wore black unitards and had long black strands coming off of us, and we danced around in circles. So I'm part of the myth of the Wizard of Oz tornado.